one. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, there we go. It's Alec Hogg here in studio at Biz News with... Lucy Ferreira. Nice to have you here, Lucy. Uh, we're going to be doing our budget speech breakdown. You guys were just about as busy as I was yesterday. Just about, but not quite. I think you were the busiest of the bees in lockup and bringing us all the latest breaking news. I had seven hours to play around <laughs> with all those uh, documents that come from the Treasury, uh, but it was, uh, it, it was a fascinating budget. There's so much interesting stuff that we can go through, and uh, indeed, we're going to be doing that today. Lucy is here to help, to prompt, and also to pick up your questions, so go ahead, do some questions for us, and here's the very first graph, Lucy. Yes. That's the one you put together, huh? Yeah, and it's, it's quite a scary graph, Alec. I, I think so, and, and this really um, shapes the whole way that Ntlantla Neni had to look at his budget this year, the government debt rate. Now, what I want you to do is have a look at where we are at the moment. We've just gone into, we just finished 2014, 2015, so there we are, if you see from my cursor. And the projections are that this is going to flatten out into the future. First of all, let's just, just understand what this is about. All around the world, rating agencies have a look at what is uh, this thing. It's called the debt to GDP ratio. So the higher you are, the more trouble you're in. Japan's at 200%. Italy's at 100%. Italy's an interesting story because they've just changed their uh, whole approach towards the labor legislation. The tight labor legislation has meant that in 20 years they've gone from where they were 20 years as an economy to today, exactly the same. They haven't grown, but the um, government debt has trebled in that period. So if you have a look back here, back 10 years ago, we were well, sitting at 31%, not great, but uh, not too bad, certainly by a global standard. And then in the run-up to the global financial crisis, that was a good time for our exports. The debt-to-GDP ratio fell up until 2008. What happened at that point was the whole world went into a freeze mode and we in South Africa decided that this was the time to start spending more on social, uh, putting the social net, spend more on trying to keep the economy running, trying not to give it a hard landing. And as a consequence of that, the debt has been rising. But the problem with debt, and particularly with government spending, it is not that easy to switch off the tap. Now, I'm going to take you to here, to 2012. At this point in time, Private Gordon said, we're going to top out at 38. We're going to top out around there. What has happened is that we are certainly not topping out at 38. We're at 40.8 at the moment. So we're already ahead of where it was expected to top out. Now we're hearing from our guys who are saying, well, we're going to top out at 44. Yeah. And I guess you've got to wonder, can you believe it? No, absolutely not, especially when you look at global emerging markets. Where things are not in our favor anymore. No. And that is how the whole budget is shaped. So we've got, a, we've got a country that's been spending a whole lot more on social welfare. It's been pumping money into the economy to avoid the hard landing, but it hasn't been grasping the structural issues. Mm -mm. And that is where, unfortunately, we are now starting to get ourselves into an increasingly tight spot. If Ntlantlaneni is right, if what he's telling us now that this, you're going to see, and this is a fairly dramatic flattening off in the debt to GDP ratio. Remember, kind of two ways that you can do this. You can, on the one hand, increase taxes, um, and on the other hand, reduce government mm -hmm. spending. That's really yeah. the option. Which hasn't really happened. On either. All. Well, it's very difficult to reduce government spending, but they, they're going to try and do it in this budget, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. But that's the one side of the equation. The other side of the equation is GDP growth. Mm -hmm. So if your, uh, your economy is growing fast, then your debt-to-GDP ratio is going to fall. Okay? If you um, reduce your budget deficit so you don't have to borrow more money in the year, then it's also going to fall. So to get it from where we are now here back to there is going to be quite an effort. Uh, the Zuma administration uh, came in with a completely different mandate, and that's where we are at the moment. Interesting, the, the whole situation there. But uh, that's, that's the, the first of the graphs. Makes a lot of sense, Lizzie. It does indeed. Okay, on to our next one, which is uh, really to take us through the fuel tax, which was the other issue. So the first issue was uh, the whole budget was shaped by 
debt is getting out of control, government debt is getting out of control. The second point was uh, how do we get this money back? Well, there it is. We went from a very low percentage of fuel from global terms in the 20s, 27.6 percent on petrol, 28.1 percent of diesel. What that means, and if you look at this, it's quite a detailed graph, but what we're trying to say here is that up until last year, if you bought a liter of petrol, you would be paying 2 Rand 24 for a general fuel levy that goes into the slush fund for Treasury and another 1 Rand and 4 cents for the road accident fund. So basically you paid around about a quarter of every Rand that you put into your tank went in tax. Now it's gone to 41%. That's a big jump. And that 41% for petrol and 43% for diesel is in line with the rest of the world. So we had, it was almost a sitter. Mm. You think about it. You know, you're sitting in, in Nene's shoes. He can't keep spending. He's got to get taxes from somewhere. So where does he look? And the one area that is below the rest, in fact, the two areas where we're below the rest of the world. One is that. Yes. But that is politically unconscionable, isn't it? Yeah, and, and it's a very contentious issue, as we know. So he couldn't really go there without massive upcry. Yeah, Kosati wouldn't exactly have been Absolutely excited not. on that one. So he had VAT, which, mm -hmm. which was not likely, and the other option he had was, hey, fuel tax, we're in the 20s. Which has been helped by the oil price. Well, it's palatable because if you were at a 14 rand uh, fuel price already, mm -hmm. and then you added another 80 cents at that point, because we were at 14 rand just a few months ago, if you went in this budget, we were at 14 rand, hey guys, you're going to be paying 15 rand for your uh, petrol in future. Uh, there would have been an outcry of no. Absolutely. Note. But we now went down to 10 rand, so hey guys, you're going to pay room. 11 rand. Exactly. Mm. And it's also room from an international perspective, so we can't now start pointing fingers at the government and saying you're overtaxing us on fuel when the Brits and the Germans and the, not the Americans, but many other countries are doing the same thing. Absolutely. So that is the, the big lot. What a, a lot of people haven't kind of caught yet is that the General fuel levy is what is in the budget figures, and that's six and a half billion rand. So we've gone from uh, 30 cents up to two rand fifty-five on the general fuel levy. That doesn't mean you aren't also paying that one rand fifty-four. There's over one rand and four cents on the road accident fund to one fifty-four. I can imagine a lot of lawyers <laughs> rubbing their hands in glee. In glee, because we we know how. Furiously, they chase that road accident fund, and now there's a, a windfall almost. The whole businesses that are built on it. And Tlatla Neni had bad news for them. He said they're going to change the laws, they're going to fix this up so that the lawyers don't take mm. the lion's share, which seems to be the case at the moment, rather than their clients getting it. But how long will that take? Well, that's the point, isn't it? And until they can get that in place, there's 98 billion rands underwater for the road accident fund. The whole thing, it's just a disaster. So he at this point said, let's raise uh, an extra 10 billion rand in taxes that you and I are going to pay so they can put that into the fuel levy. It's quite extraordinary. It is extraordinary. <laughs> anyway, uh, that means 17.3 billion to be exactly, uh, to be precise, is what we as citizens of South Africa are going to be paying extra uh, through our petrol in this year. There was a, uh, you, you could think of this, we've got the problems in Gauteng with the e-tolls. Why not maybe take that 10 billion rand from the, uh, which is going into the road accident fund and put that into e-tolls? Mm. But it was, uh, we did discuss this in the press conference yesterday. Uh, and we, the way it works is you go there, you have a lockup, they give you all these, all the documentation including the speech. And Hundreds then, of pages, I'm sure. Uh, they're huge. Yes, <laughs> they're like, like tomes. Uh, and then you you work, what I do is I work through the speech first to have a look at what the, the highlights are and then at half past ten, so you're in there and block up from around seven, so you've got three and a half hours. Then we had the video link through to Cape Town where in Club and it was quite interesting. He actually on the this, on this stage, he, it was him, it was the Deputy Minister Jonas. Uh, on the other hand um, uh, was the Director General and the fourth person on the stage was the former Director General, who's now the Reserve Bank Governor, Lesetje Khanyakho. Mm -hmm. um, three of them had quite a lot to say. Mm -hmm. Lesetje didn't have a single comment <laughs> the whole hour and a bit. Um, he just sat there as a Reserve Bank Governor and sure. maybe there was, he was expecting a, a question. Which Nothing was thrown his way.
Yeah, what was he doing there? Absolutely. I had Absolutely. an inter had an interview like that once uh, on television where a guy brought his lawyer in and his lawyer just sat there <laughs> in silence, in adding, silence, adding no value. Um, I see we've got a question, and uh, I think you have in part answered it. And I don't know if there's any more that you want to expand on. It's from EJ, and um, he says, "Will this field tax be used to pay for Etel's failure?" This is no. Uh, the, the short answer yeah. is no, but the long answer is partly mm. because. Remember, road accident fund is a government liability, mm. um, and the, although the fuel tax, they can kind of play with words a little bit, the guys in, in government. An example of this was they said they will convert the debt in Eskom into equity. Mm. Well, hey guys, you're the only shareholder, you actually are responsible for <laughs> all the debt and all the equity, so now you make some of your debt equity. What's the difference? Absolutely. In in this case, with the uh, with the the fuel, the money that's going into the road accident fund, they have said he did say some money would go to support e tolls. Hmm. So there's going to be some money coming in. They haven't decided how much yet, but it will reduce the liability on Harting motorists. We hear, we'll know how much in when they've worked that one out, but it all comes from the same pot. Hmm. So I. Yes, you could say some of the money we're paying extra for fuel mm. will be going into e-tolls, but uh, they are not budging from this user pay principle. Mm. And in a way, that's quite sensible because mm. if you're going to be building more toll roads or more good roads, government can't afford to pay for it. No. We've got to pay for it. So yeah. the whole the whole e-tolls there. I mean, it's it's too long long-winded for us to get into that, but that's a it's kind of a different situation. So this is the big story. The The big story here is definitely on the fuel tax. It was where he had scope, uh, and <laughs> boy, did he use it. Um, blew 80 cents a litre, just as well the, um, the oil prices come down. Here's another issue, property transfer duties, and on this one, it's, I put this line up here, Lucy, because it gives you an understanding of the thrust of the budget. Mm -hmm. It's all about redistribution, actually, mm -hmm. um, which is aligned with when you saw that very first graph on the debt to GDP ratio. Yeah. Uh, it's aligned with the Zuma administration taking from the rich and giving to the poor. Yeah. Call it Robin yeah, Hood. Absolutely. Remember Robin Hood? Of course, which we didn't see in dividends tax, um, but we did see it in a huge way with the property levy and... Well, dividends tax they couldn't do. Now, these are interesting points. We could, They could not budge on dividend tax or corporate tax mm -hmm. because they're in line with the rest of the world. Yes. And when you start fiddling with and that... And there's a need to be competitive, or try anyway. Exactly. Yeah. And then companies will go and relocate Absolutely. elsewhere or perhaps relocate parts of their business elsewhere. Sure. So they, they couldn't move on dividend end, uh, they could have moved, he could have moved on capital gains tax, but that's very, very small amounts of mm. money that comes in. This though, the same with personal income taxes, two um, sides of the same coin, shows you exactly where the heads are in the Zuma administration. Yeah. Below 600,000 in the past, you didn't pay transfer duty, now it's below 750. I did a few numbers, if you buying a 2 million rand house, well you would have paid transfer duty of 77,000 in the past, now you pay 65. So very, very small difference there. Who buys a 2 million rand house? Well, certainly not people who are listening to this broadcast. Uh, <laughs> then we move on to maybe a 3 million rand house, and that's where the crossover already becomes, becomes quite apparent. 3 million rand house, you would have paid transfer duties of 157,000. Now remember, this is just a tax. It's a pure, pure tax. You're getting no value mm -hmm. whatsoever. Nothing's changed. It takes months for the transfer to go through the deeds office. They haven't all of a sudden rapidly improved their situation. This is just a straight full-on tax because you happen to be have worked hard enough to be able to afford it. Now you pay 167,500. So you pay 10 grand more. Mm. Not too bad at 3,000, 3 million. 5 million rand house, this starts getting interesting. There you will pay 70,000 rand more in property taxes and of course thereafter it goes up and up and this is the reason why. It used to be 8% extra, now it's 11% yeah. extra. And I suppose the rationale is that if you're buying 5 million rand house, you can afford it. Yeah, but you can also afford to emigrate. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's the problem. As, as, as we've seen in responses, I've, I've got another question coming through, and I'm not, I'm not sure if we're going to be dealing with this later. Um, but it's from Temba, and he's asking, why are we paying for customs and excise levies? 
customs and excise levies, Timo, are a uh, what happens, and it's it's quite an interesting um, part of the whole picture here, is that governments around the world discover new ways of taxing us. And many years ago, there was no such thing as income tax, for instance. Then some bright spot <laughs> decided, let's tax the income of the people who work here. Here in our country, we had an, an awful thing called a hut tax. It was introduced hundreds of, or a hundred and something years ago, which was a, a, a tax where the colonialists wanted to tax the local people just because they had a hut, they had to pay a hut tax, forcing them to go and work for uh, big capital back in those days. So taxes are an awful thing, but customs and excise duties, they call it sin taxes. They have been around ever since somebody thought, ah, we can tax our population for smoking cigarettes and for drinking beer or wine or whatever. And every year they go up by at least the inflation rate and roughly half now of what you are paying for a pack of cigarettes or for um, some alcoholic uh, beverages go straight to government. So we, we're getting there with petrol, it's now 40%, and we're already there with cigarettes. They'll come up with another idea, you can be sure. Now that uh, they've lost the, the battle on the, well, they're kind of in line with the rest of the world on fuel, um, but that's customs and excise, and of course also when you bring uh, goods into the country, you also pay uh, customs taxes there too. All right, let's move on to the impact of these proposals because this kind of puts it all into, an, an, into perspective, particularly how much we're now paying extra on petrol. Personal income tax, uh, well, there's the big number to actually look at. It, it's a complicated, again, table, and you can work through this at your leisure. But that 8.275 billion is actually the key number. Before this budget, it was estimated, and in fact, even in October last year in Lantla Nene, uh, intimated that he would have to find 12.5 billion rand. That was the number. So he only found 8.3 billion rand, yeah. excluding, remember, that 10 for the road accident fund. Where's the rest going to come from? Is another 4 billion rand somewhere. Mm. Well, that's going to come from cutting government spending. And that's also something that's been very quiet in this budget. He, he, he mentioned uh, almost in passing that government departments are going to not be able to employ new people. Uh, they're looking to have a salary increase of about 5%, but as Mira Muller mentioned yesterday, that yeah. uh, they budgeted 7.7 mm -hmm. when they're negotiating with public servants. So I don't know where all of this I was comes about from. I to mention that because that was quite, a, quite an interesting point if you just look at inflation numbers and, you know, curbing yeah. that spending. Where's actually, the balance? Actually, talking about yesterday's interviews, uh, when I spoke with Sizwe Nguxana from, uh, from First, uh, First National Bank, he said to me, yes, but the property taxes are, are you're going to save money up mm. to three million. Yes. He was absolutely right. I actually misread that. Sorry, Caesar. I, I apologize. <laughs> Public apology. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When you're up at four in the morning, you're allowed to make a couple of little mistakes. <laughs> Got to give you a break somewhere. <laughs> but yeah, have a look over here, and this is where it's about. So you're increasing income tax by one percentage point. That means in the past, if you were a top earner, you would pay 40% of what you earned over the top marginal figure to government, now you pay 41, all right, so it's not that bad, not too many people unhappy about that. However, in total, there's 9.5 billion rand that's going to be pulled in from this increase in income tax, and we haven't increased income tax in this country for 10 years, Yeah. so that's another issue. Wasn't it 20 years? Could be, a, could be. well, it's at least yeah, a decade. Yeah. So it seems unprecedented almost. All right, <laughs> well, not unprecedented, in the, in the bad old days they used to jack up income tax all the time. But fiscal drag relief of 8.5 billion, what does that mean? Got nothing to do with cross dresses. This is to do with the adjustment of the tax tables every year. So what happens is the, because inflation, generally people will get an increase in line with inflation. Because inflation goes up, they adjust the tax tables. And what Treasury has committed to doing, and government's committed to doing, is adjusting those tax tables down. So if you get no salary increase, mm -hmm. you're going to pay less this year than you would have paid last year, provided you're in the bottom end, you're below 37,000 rand a month. Yeah. Yeah. So that's where it all kind of fits together. Yeah. But look at that, and this is really the, the number. In total, government is getting 8.3 billion for its, its uh, pool inside, but there's another 10 billion outside of this that we as citizens are going to be paying which doesn't even appear on the numbers mm -hmm. that goes into the road accident fund. And they say, well, because it's going into the road accident fund, uh, we don't bring it into our revenue figures, which of course is bunk. 
because mm. the road accident fund, like Eskom, is 100% owned by government. Of course. So it's a little bit disingenuous, but mm, fool some of the people some of the time. <laughs> On to small business tax, and uh, there is some relief here. It's not small business, it's micro business. They like to call it SMEs. If you're generating turnover of under 100,000 rand a month, I'm sure there are many people listening to this uh, podcast or to this webcast who are saying, hang on, I earn more than 100,000 rand a month or I generate in pre-tax income more than 100,000 rand a month and I, can I benefit from this? Well, sadly, mm -hmm. you can't. You're going to have to become a business person to do that. But uh, the good thing here, it's for micro-enterprises really and as you can see, the tax rates have been dramatically reduced. Mm -hmm. uh, at a million, you go down uh, from 15.5 or let's talk about 750,000, you would have paid 15,500 tax or they would have, now it's 665, are almost tax free, um, up to a million rand turnover. Very, very good, but again, micro enterprises, not, uh, not exactly small businesses. Okay, Lucy, we're winning. We are winning. All right, on to the next one, the whole impact of tax proposals. Now this is a graph or a table rather that I think tells the story of South Africa. At the top end, we've got 2.7%. Okay, let's just tell you how this works. This is taxable income down over here. So anybody who earns under 70,000 Rand a year and is registered, there's 8.5 million people roughly who've registered as taxpayers, they generate 182 million Rand in taxable income for themselves. But because they earn less than 70,000 Rand, they pay no tax. There are 8.5 million of them. On the other end of the scale, take the people who earn more than a million rand a year, the top end, these are the job creators, these are the people who add value to the economy, one would presume. Um, there are 188, 189,000 of them, 2.7% of the total taxpayers. They earn about 18, 19% of the taxable income and they pay 33%. So they earn 19% of the taxable income but they pay a third of all the taxable income in South Africa. That is called the progressive tax rate, but these are the people that the uh, govern, the, the politicians, politicians in other parts of Africa say you should be protecting them, South Africa. Don't let these fellows go off to Perth or Australia or San Diego or London. Look after these guys because one third of your income tax is being generated by these people. The golden goose, you could call them, is the golden goose being throttled to death. Some, some would really agree with you. I know um, Munir Hassan from Saika thinks so. Mm. I think there's lots of, uh, oopsie, there's, there's quite a lot of uh, questions that are coming through, you see. Yep, that. and um, we've, we've very much addressed them. Um, one was just wanting to get hold of these slides because uh, they joined late, so we'll send them off after. And um, the other was just if that, month, if that turnover figure was monthly from the small business table. No, uh, let's just go back there. Um, that's pretty easy to do. Um, small business tax, no, I wish it was monthly. Um, no, it's, for, it's annually. So you've got to be, uh, what's it, about 80 uh, 80 odd thousand rand, uh, 8, 96, okay? eight maybe 81, 82 thousand rand a month. You've got to be below that. Uh, it's it's uh, if you're earning a million rand turnover a month, your taxable income is substantially higher. Sorry, wish I had better news there. But on this one, it's uh, it's quite clear. There are seven, roughly seven million taxpayers uh, who actually pay tax because they earn more than 70 thousand rand per annum or have taxable income of more than 70,000 rand per annum. That, that is also something very different, of course, because you have deductions in your taxable income. But uh, that gives you an insight into South Africa. And clearly, uh, you, you must not anticipate that this little grouping here, the 2.8% uh, of the taxpayers who pay a third of the income tax generally, are going to have any, uh, being cut any slack into the future. Because if you are the ruling party in South Africa, you look at 188,000 votes and you look at four and eight and a half million votes, and clearly it's it's very obvious who wins. Okay, let's move on to these uh, revenue breakdowns. There, this is quite an interesting table as well, as you can see the uh, the way that the various tax uh, areas have actually gone over the past few years, annual percentage change. Now remember, we are running a country with a 4.4% 4 .4 inflation rate. 
and yet personal income tax in the most recent year is budgeted to go up 13%. Yeah. Corporate income tax, well, you can understand corporates because they ain't going to be making more profits. Mm -hmm. So they'll be a little bit, the economy's tight, they are looking to corporate profits only going up 3%. The dividends tax, there's a bit of a delay factor there clearly, up 23% skill development. Transfer duties, now you think that those property increases are a good, I saw Andrew Golding from uh, Pam Golding Properties, he's got rocks in his head. Here he is. He deals in the top end of the market. Mm -hmm. He was saying on a press release he sent out yesterday, the changes in the transfer duties are good. Andrew, 22% <laughs> more from transfer duties. Yeah. How can that be good? What's Butch? it going to do to the property market? What's it going to do to his clients? Exactly. You know, we said to money, uh, to <laughs> money web clients, <laughs> business clients, if we said to, the, uh, to business clients, oh, guys, we're going to give you 22% uh, less value. Mm -hmm for uh, what, you, what you invest with us, I don't think we'd have too many clients left. No. Okay, not a good thing, Andrew Golding. Uh, reassess, please. Uh, value added tax, there we go. That's kind of in line with, uh, with inflation, slightly higher than that. And uh, there's an e electricity levy. Interesting to see that they're actually d looking at that going down. Of course, the fuel levy going up about 10.3% is a little pessimistic. It does exclude that extra 50 cents a litre, though. But think of just that fuel levy, just the general fuel levy, the slush fund for mm -hmm. revenue is more than double the inflation rate it's going up by. We have to hope and pray that the frackers in America keep fracking, <laughs> that they keep the Saudis uh, producing lots and lots of crude oil, so we keep the oil price down. Sounds like they're going to, so let's hope. So we do have some questions coming through. I don't know if you're happy to, to sure. take some. Let's go. Um, so one we've got coming from Dale. Hi, was the tax for small businesses for any type of business, even if the business is purely a property company dealing with rental income? Um, I don't know if we have the detail on that. We might have to get back to Dale there. Dale, uh, I don't think you can differentiate between a small business and a small business. Yeah. So if it's it a small business, is. yeah, you're in, you're in business. <laughs> Um, and we've got another one from Michael. Uh, surely the key to growth in SA is to increase income and therefore tax of the 8 million who are such poor earners. Of course it is. And you've hit it on the head, Michael. That is where the whole policy, the whole plan falls down. Because if you've got a plan that is not growing the economy, if you've got a plan that is, is, is not ensuring that economic growth hits the kind of targets that uh, you, you need to have as a developing country, then your, everything falls down eventually. And I really, I'll just go back to this uh, very first graph because this is what it's all about, that government debt to GDP ratio. If this continues to rise or this, this increase over here has been because of increases in government spending, increases in social benefits and not reinvesting into the economy, or certainly 60% apparently, according to the speech yesterday, 60% of the money that the government spends outside of its interest that it has to, has to pay off uh, the debt, 60% of that goes to social welfare. That's a scary number that we're getting to. We're getting to a welfare state, and at mm -hmm. some point in time, those who produce the economic activity say, oh, I'll find a better place in the world to do it. Now, thankfully, we have something called home bias. Thankfully, uh, we love South Africa mm -hmm. because we were born here and we grew up here and this is the place we want to live and our friends are here, etc. But there comes a point where those who are creating wealth in an economy say that I want to, they, 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 they overcome that home bias, if you like. And uh, that's the dangerous, dangerous point that you can reach at if you continue to, to um, plug out the economy. So it's an absolutely vital story that you've made there. The registered taxpayers of eight and a half million. We need the economy to grow. We need these people to earn a lot more. We need income inequality to balance out. And as a consequence, and that only comes from economic growth. And as a consequence of that, uh, the, the burden will be more fairly shared. Then I win. You won. Okay. You what won. about more questions or shall we uh, move on? We, we've got a couple and I'm just going through them from um, the, the time that we have to get through them. So what happens to the tax on a small business once the turnover goes over a million rand? And is this inclusive or exclusive of that? Hmm. Quite a technical one. Yeah, it is technical and it's, uh, it's outside my sphere <laughs> of conference. Sorry, you're going to have to ask uh, Munir Hassan or someone like that at Saki, <laughs> uh, at Saika. Um, 
the the basically once it, th this is a benefit for a micro enterprise. Once a micro enterprise gets above a micro enterprise, then you kind of fall into the rest of the of the tax gap. Mm -hmm. But it's it's I haven't done those numbers. Mm -hmm. This is quite a nice one, Alec. I think I think before we carry on, um, which sectors of the JAC do we expect to be impacted by the new budget? That, and that's yeah, really what we're trying to get at. Yeah. We we're trying to get at the um, in fact uh, the winners and losers, if you like. Yeah. Winners are the people who are going to be providing um, certain services to businesses. Unfortunately, we don't have any book producers, but if you were in that game, government is now spending more and more money on mm. books, textbooks, because it realizes that you need to get the, the young people, you need to at least give them textbooks, and that was quite a big story in, in the budget this year. The, the losers are just about everywhere. Um, the big business is a big loser. Uh, there's no doubt that the electricity is going to hit big business. Um, there's nothing at all that you can start getting excited about as far as the, um, the, the, the labor legislation is concerned. They still, the, the government still hasn't clicked to the fact that um, yeah. inflexible labor legislation means you don't hire people, means that you don't get business growing, which, which, means, exactly, which means that your taxes eventually stop growing. And in fact, there's a there's a good tax versus GDP uh, that figure, and that's something else that they look at as well. Look at that, uh, the, the gross domestic product. Uh, there's a total tax revenue that's following it there, and the gross domestic product, and that's the the uh, that's quite an optimistic graph that we've got from Treasury. Um, this, by the way, is not real GDP. Mm. We always talk about real GDP, which is what you've got to do because you've got to take inflation out of the out of the picture. But this is nominal GDP, nominal growth in the economy. Nominal growth 9%, but uh, last year I think the inflation rate was 6, so you, you're down below 3, in fact not even 9, it's around 8%. That's, uh, what they're saying to us here is that, hey, we're being really good as government, we're not overtaxing you. Well, that was a period where there was excess in taxes, that was a period where uh, taxes were nowhere near what growth uh, in the economy was like, and we've gone back into that mm. growing uh, of of, of, of the taxes. And here, this is probably the best thing to talk to uh, because we, we go through the, the budget in a nutshell and the, from here we can pull out uh, the key issues. Uh, I don't, I'm not going to go uh, give death by PowerPoint, but first of all, there's no doubt that higher prices per litre will eventually knock on effect. Now, who would it affect? It would affect uh, Imperial who got hammered as you saw recently in their results by the lower car sales. Mm -hmm. We're coming to realize as South Africans that we are paying, we're wasting too much uh, on our vehicles. In the longer term, and I don't think it'll be a, an immediate impact, but in the longer term our cars are too expensive and people who are retailing cars, this is not a great budget for you yeah. when you get an 80 cents a, a, a litre increase. So that, that would be the negative. The, um, the fact that income tax rates haven't really risen that much, well, that would mean the bottom end of the market, uh, retailers, so you'd be looking particularly at ShopRite, uh, to a lesser extent, pick and pay, mm. uh, they will be happy with this yeah. because the redistribution of income to the bottom end is, is a good thing for and them. I mean, White is quite happy with his, his recent stint and the, the results there, so it's probably just going to carry on in that trajectory. Yeah, Whitey Bisson of ShopRite, nothing wrong with being in that. They're the, the people who really benefit a yeah. great deal. So if you're owning, owning uh, ShopRite shares, I'd be quite happy. Woolworths is now an offshore play to a large degree <laughs> with Australia, so you've got to look at different issues there. But it's, it's not going to be, you know, it's like a, you see, it's like a, a, a clamp that is going on the richer mm. sector of the population. The way I described it after thinking about it a lot was that there's plenty in this budget for poor people mm -hmm. or for the bottom end of the market to get to get pretty happy about. Yes. They're going to pay less when they buy their houses. They they are going to pay less in tax this mm -hmm. year because the rich are paying more. And it's and it's always this, you know that story about if you get a bonus of a million rand, you're delighted until you hear that your coworker got a bonus of a million rand in one rand. Yeah. And you think, damn it, <laughs> they're getting more than me. It's a similar thing when it comes to, uh, to to taxpayers. Well, the rich are getting hit, so I'm quite happy. So the, the poorer people will feel a lot a lot mm. more encouraged by this kind of move. 
you'll have more confidence there. If they'll spend more, that's the end of the, the area, but uh, the market that'll be happy. But there wasn't enough of a contraction, a contraction onto the top end of the market to get them unhappy. Mm. So it's almost like, you know, it's a great country, it's great weather, we have lovely people, um, the home bias is not going to really be affected by mm. this uh, set in, of budget, yeah. but I think next year yeah. and the year thereafter, watch yeah. out. So it's almost like we, we, we're getting this, uh, it's squeezing, the lemon's being squeezed, mm -hmm. how far can you squeeze yeah. it before you have a reaction? I don't think there's a reaction in this budget. So even at Woolies, I'm going to keep on spending. <laughs> Micro enterprises, well, that doesn't help us in the stock market. Uh, certainly smokers and drinkers, mm, at some point in time. You see, we just don't know when that tipping point is, is reached. As far as electricity is concerned, a lot said in the state of the nation and again here um, about the electricity levy. Uh, I would be very concerned at the moment about uh, OsloMittal and Sassel because the carbon tax is coming in. Uh, that's, a, that's a guarantee. They put this extra two cents a kilowatt hour on electricity because until 2016, that's when the carbon tax comes in. And who is going to pay the most carbon tax? 80% of carbon emissions in this country are generated by um, es uh, Eskom mm. and Sassel. Eskom and Sassel, and I think also Middle are quite a big one as well. Sassel in this country is mm. going to be the big loser. Eskom, well, I guess we're paying them two cents a litre a kilowatt hour now so that they'll be able to pay the carbon tax when it comes in in 2016. But they'll pay it, and again, it's yeah. government. It's, I mean, it's Sassel's already struggling with the oil price, so... Sassel is a big loser out of uh, an increase in the carbon tax. We don't have um, companies who are really the property transfer duties. We haven't got estate agents. We used to have AIDA was, uh, was listed some years ago. They aren't there mm -hmm. anymore, so that's no big deal. Um, the economic growth rate, that's an issue. If you're going for big business, I'd be concerned because the GDP growth rate as recently as October was estimated at 2.5%. Now it's 2%. Mm -hmm. That's a big adjustment in six months or five months, actually. Uh, and so on the one hand, if you, you're going to be okay uh, if you whitey bus on because there's more going to the bottom end of the market. If you have a look at these GDP growth rate figures, you've got to worry about South Africa, Inc., and those companies who are heavily exposed towards it. But much of the JSC now is exposed offshore, so it isn't really that much of a problem. A uh, budget deficit of 3.9%. We can't really believe these things anymore. You know, they, they, they make every year Treasury is over-optimistic, and every year they say, we're not trying to mislead you, but every year they've got excuses why things have changed. Mm. I'm concerned, as I've articulated, about this debt-to-GDP ratio. It's now expected to stabilize at 44%. Uh, will that actually eventuate every time that we've heard uh, about the debt-to-GDP ratio coming under control? It hasn't come through. Social assistance, there we go. We've now got an additional $7 billion, um, that's going there. 16.4, 16.5 million people in our country who were receiving that. Gauteng uh, e-tolls, we, we mentioned that a little bit earlier. That's not really going to make much of a difference. So overall... Uh, I would be looking here for companies that are innovative, that are, that are, are uh, agile, mm. that can move uh, more rapidly to the opportunities. I would be steering away from companies that have got big labor forces. Um, there's nothing in here mm. that, that makes me feel that our labor legislation is going to be correctly addressed mm. so that it can stimulate economic growth. It's almost like the big yeah. won't benefit. The little guys who are agile, well, the gazelles, have, uh, that's where I'd be, I'd be focusing my attention. Mm, yeah, and are we likely to see more listings on the back of that? You know, there, there was a bit of a listings run last year. Could we expect something similar this year? Listings are based on ratings, and ratings are based on interest rates. Now, when you have a country where the debt is rising all the time, eventually it catches up with you, despite quantitative easing and everything else <laughs> that's happening around the world and then your interest rates start rising. Mm. And when interest rates rise, you then get the listings you don't want. You get the listings from people who can't borrow from banks. Oh. Um, in, in, uh, in inevitably, a company that takes its stock to the market does so because it can raise money mm -hmm. more cheaply than elsewhere. Yeah. So there's possible that uh, if the ratings hold on the market and interest rates don't rise too much, 
uh, you yeah. could see more more listing, but it's it, it's a balance between the two. Yeah, and Alec, an, an interesting question. Just I think that a lot of investors have been looking for and on is what happened to the tax incentives on savings coming in first of March. So that was uh, that before the budget. He just referred mm -hmm. to that in passing. It's yeah. happening on the first of March. It's a okay. huge huge story. Yeah. Uh, in fact, it was interesting um, when he was uh, Nene was making his speech. He said that, and there was a, a muted applause. <laughs> and then he said, let me repeat this for you. <laughs> we are introducing the tax-free savings uh, scheme on the 1st of March. And then there was rapturous applause. I guess the people who'd been sleeping woke up, yeah. and those who hadn't been paying as much attention uh, just followed those who had been paying attention. It is a big thing. It's mm -hmm. a good thing. It's, it's uh, again, you know, we've, we've got a country which has a past, historically, mm -hmm. Uh, it's an enormous thing to overcome, but we've got to stop and say no one really cares mm. in the rest of the world. Mm. We can care and we can do, we can upset people in this country and chase those 188,000 people away, but we have to make a life for ourselves into the future, mm. and the way we're going to do that is what we do in future. Mm. So things like the tax-free savings scheme, 30,000 rand. Um, benefit for anybody who puts, you know, it, it's, it's not aimed at the super rich, but mm -hmm. it's going to help to build a middle society. And a, and a good culture for investing and saving and, you know, utilizing the... The culture starts when people get the opportunity to work. Mm. And we're not giving them the opportunity to work, and that little penny hasn't dropped yet. That penny will drop one day. Let's hope that it isn't when our debt to GDP ratio is at 70%. Sure. Let's hope. Okay, get into some of those questions because we're running out of time. We are, um, and I've, I've got a couple here. Some are, some are longer than others. Um, do the social grants keep the ANC in power and also create a culture of wanting freebies? Um, that's another one from Michael. They keep the ANC in power, no doubt, uh, but they don't create a culture of freebies because they're too low. Mm. And remember that if, you're getting, if you can get a job at 8,000, 10,000, 12,000 rand a month, uh, why would you want to social, be on social grants at 1,500, 1,600? It's, they're not high enough. Mm -hmm. And this is a thing that, that many of us don't get. A social grant in South Africa is really just to stop you from starving. Mm. It's not something that is going to be preferable to getting a job. Mm. Mm. I've got another interesting, and I suppose it's less of a question and more of a note um, from Bosman. Uh, ShopRite fell 2.8% today. Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you know. We could have a giggle at that it's for, a the, market. for the it, traders. <laughs> yeah, no. You've got to look at I think that would be a reaction of some investors to the results that came out. Mm. It's unlikely to be a reaction to this budget. Mm. Mm. Any news on the national minimum wage, says Chris? No, but there was news on the national health insurance scheme, and that... Uh, it's what's happened there is it's it's moving forward now. We've got national health insurance, which is something South Africa needs again to mm -hmm. look after the people who don't have access to health uh, or health care, proper health care. That's going to take a couple of percentage points uh, extra on VAT. VAT is being held back. Mm -hmm. uh, it it wasn't moved this time around. Fortunately, there was somewhere else to go and get the money from, being the fuel tax. But VAT next year or the, the year thereafter, you can almost bank it. Yeah, I, I wonder if, if the oil price hadn't dropped so dramatically, what would have happened to VAT, and it might have been a different story. It could have been. Uh, and then there would have been a real dilemma. Do you increase the petrol price hmm. at a time that it's already high, or do you risk the ire of the unions at a time when it's already high? You would have had to do one of the two. Yeah. Um, there is, you can't just have big budget deficits in this age because what happens is if your budget deficit grows too much, mm. the ratings agencies de downgrade you and we're already on the cusp of, of becoming uh, junk bonds mm. and when they downgrade you, your interest rates on your debt, remember we're paying over 100 billion rand a year in debt, mm. will be, it's projected to be 150 billion in three years time. That escalates, goes mm. sky, skyrockets when you need to borrow new money. So it won't affect your, uh, the money you already borrowed, yeah. but all new money, your junk grade. So we've got to somehow keep, or government has got to somehow keep this balancing act. Mm. 
Yeah, and I think I think one last one coming through that I suppose sums up the the ideology of what the budget means for South Africa is. Um, is South Africa a good long-term investment, or should one lessen the exposure? And that's from Andrew. No, it's it's, uh, it's a tough one. <laughs> not really. Um, the way the government is going at the moment, the economic policies of the government at the moment, are in a direction which does not make it business friendly. It's clear. Mm. Um, they have issues that are often driven by politics rather than economics, which is an, unfortunately a, a trend that happens in a developing country. I've said it before, because we're moving in this direction, we've had pathetic economic growth in the last two years while the rest of the world has been recovering. Mm. It's purely and simply because we haven't grasped the structural issues in this economy. When we start grasping those structural issues, that's the time to buy South Africa Incorporated. At the moment, we're not grasping the structural issues. Mm -hmm. You've got to be looking for income streams from uh, hard currencies. Unfortunately, okay. as much as uh, I love this country and I will um, do what I can to assist in, mm -hmm. in growing it, as, as I think we all do, we all love this place, but uh, when you have a, uh, econ a, a political dogma mm -hmm. uh, which is going in a particular direction and you don't see, if you, dis if you agree with it, well then put your money into South Africa. If you think that the NDP is the answer to all our problems, mm. stick your money in here. South African business has got 670 billion rand in cash on its balance sheets waiting to be invested. Mm. Is it being invested in South Africa? No. Are we making ourselves competitive enough to bring it here? Well the rational decision on that is I've got all this cash sitting in the bank. Um, if this place is going to give me a good return on my cash, I'll put it in. Mm -hmm. If this place is not going to give me a good return, I'll look elsewhere, we'll just keep it in the bank. Absolutely. So look at what corporate South Africa is doing and follow. Mm. Okay, I just uh, I think that's kind of the end of our time. Lucy? It is. A couple is. more questions. I see they're coming through now. They, a bit later. they, <laughs> they are. Um, we can go through the last two here. Could an increase mm. in VAT really have hurt the government's image with all the negativity at the moment? That's from Dale. Mm. Good point. Uh, and there were some people who said they're so far down uh, they may as well have made us really, really take better medicine now and uh, turn things around in future. I'm not so sure right now that the uh, trade unions, who still have significant power at the moment, uh, wouldn't have mobilized in a way that would have made it fairly embarrassing. So we might have to deal with that next year, but next year they'll be able to sell the VAT increase on the fact that it's, uh, it's improving national health insurance. I think that's really what it was about. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and um, what about curbing corruption as, a, as an outro to yeah, what that's doing to our yes. deficit? Curbing corruption is uppermost. Now, this is another urban myth. It, it actually irritates the life out of me when I hear people saying that the ANC, um, as you can hear, I'm not a fan of a lot of the ANC, but that the ANC is a corrupt party and that the governors, the politicians simply want to increase corruption so that they can put their snouts in the trough. I hate that because South Africa has the most transparent budget in the world. Get that. We have a better budget in transparency than anywhere else on earth. Now if you wanted to be corrupt, that's the last thing you want to do. This year by the way, they've improved the transparency in two ways by adding in uh, the state-owned enterprises for instance. So that already big document, just go and read it, go and look at it, you can see that's the first thing. The second thing was a, uh, a very important, actually critical thing in the State of the Nation address that was completely missed was that President Zuma has signed into law that government employees, state employees may no longer do business with the state. Now you might remember during the Mbeki administration that was resisted all the way through. It's in law now and with the new uh, procurement SAR that has been uh, installed they are looking for state employees who are breaking that law, who are actually doing business with the state through their wives or families or whatever the case might be. We are making progress on corruption. It is moving in the right direction. Don't knock people on the head when they are trying to do the right thing. And I think we need to just step back, look at the facts. The facts are this is not a government that wants to be more corrupt. This is a government that wants to be cleaner. It is really hurtful to people within government who, uh, who are seeing that. Good. 
this is it. That's us for today. Thank you for joining us on this webcast. We will have uh, it transcribed. We'll have everything on uh, Biz News a little bit later. Uh, but I hope you feel well a bit better informed now about what happened yesterday. Thanks, Alec. That was great. Very insightful.